Lamas, Lamas is a people's festivity. It is translated as a loaf of bread, a bun of bread. In Scotland, it has been called the Festival of Leaves. This time doesn't only signify the end of the harvest season, but also the birds, the Imbolc messengers, who came to us then, prepared to migrate back to where they came from. The cuckoo bird stops cooing. That is how our ancient ancestors predicted that the time of Lamas was coming. The cuckoo bird was the first one to signal the time to take stock. And this festivity, for people, was the time to assess the results. And since folks were mainly preoccupied with agricultural work, this meant securing provisions for themselves and for their tribe, stockpiling supplies for the upcoming winter. The action of harvest served as the symbol for taking stock. This is why a wheat stack serves as the symbol of lamas and it was left on the edge of a field as an offering to the spirits of a place. People would leave the first and the last harvested stack. These two stacks served as a symbol. The first stack was a gift to the mother. She always received the first of every harvest. And the last stack was for those of the invisible world who are still present here. Our share to our good neighbors, our share for the cold winter. And this was considered to be right. It was considered to be polite. And the ritualistic symbolism of Lamas was related, of course, specifically to the unification of people. The first harvest bread was baked, and this bread was shared together with other people, as well as with the local spirits. And it is specifically from the first loaf, the first bread, that this festivity began. I will tell you about its ritual part, about what we do in the action as a ritual, a little bit later. Once we finish with the actual comprehension, with the actual immersion into the mystery, into this very festivity. The second name of this festival, Luna Sa, has more of a magical meaning rather than a human one. It is a very ancient festival. The festivity and its ancient name originated in Ireland after its native god, Lu. Lu is quite a peculiar god who has many faces and depictions. He goes by many names and is in fact the grown-up god Kupala. You can say that it is actually the matured Kupala who one day came to the Tua de Danan, the tribe of the goddess Danu, as an amazing young god. They called him the god of all arts and all crafts. Why did they call him that? As told to us by the legend, once upon a time, a god who called himself Lu came to Tara, which was the dwelling place of the goddess Danu's children. He was asked by the gatekeeper, what is it that he can do? Luke said, ask me, I am a smith. The gatekeeper replied, we already have a smith, we don't need two smiths. Maybe you can do something else? Then ask me, says Luke, I am a singer, we already have a singer. Then ask me, I am a healer, we already have a healer too. Maybe you can do something else? Ask me, said Luke. I am a carpenter, we have a carpenter as well, and whatever professions Luke happened to list, the gatekeeper replied that they already have that one and have no need for another. 
Then Luke Luke said, ask me, do you have anyone who can do all these professions at the same time? That made the gatekeeper think. He went to the gods and told them that down by the gate, there was a unique craftsman who can do anything that the gods can do. The gods reasoned that it takes a truly unique consciousness to be able to do that which they themselves can't, to be everything at once. And so Lu was invited to join the tribe. Eventually, he became the ruling god and battled the Fomorians. Next, there was a prophecy, and the prophecy read as follows. You see, Luke's origins, as the legend describes, are quite marvelous. His mother is an ancient goddess derived from the primordial forces, forces of the elements. She was called Ithlen, the only daughter of the chief Fomorian named Baylor, single-eyed Baylor. His father was Kian, the son of the healer god Dian Sei, of the goddess Daino tribe. A long time ago, it was prophesied to Baylor that it will be his grandchild who will bring about his demise. And since at that time he only had one daughter, he locked her up in a glass tower on a deserted island, thereby safeguarding himself from approaching death. But Kian, of course, was able to get to her, and that is how Lu was born. We've seen this legend many other times. A maiden locked up in a tower only because a father got spooked by a prophecy. In Greece, we will find a similar story regarding the birth of Perseus. His path follows the same analogy only in Greek mythology. And this maiden, locked up in a tower, later known as Rapunzel, following a later Celtic myth, she too is present practically everywhere. The maiden is the hidden earth, shot earth, robbed of freedom by those currently in power. But it finds a way to get free nonetheless and to give birth to someone who must be born. So that is how Lu was born, and later fought the Fomorians, and as per prophecy, did kill his grandfather Baylor, and everything happened as it should have. He did avenge the single-armed god Nuadu, Nuadu of the Silver Hand. And here, of course, we catch the breath of the northern wind, of the north pantheon, and recognize God Tyr in the one of the silver hand. And the omnipresent Odin is not too difficult to be recognized in Lu, who then still had both of his eyes. And Lu's name in Scottish, ancient Gaelic language, is in tune with the name of a raven. And it is said that he was accompanied by two ravens, his inseparable companions, which made the Saxons, who came to Irish lands, see in this ancient god their own all too familiar Odin, just very young, just very and very young. Although Lu is not Odin. He is merely one of his projections, a very close one. By the rule of omniscience, he was just as skillful and just as omniscient. He was the god of poetry and magic and all crafts, all martial arts, and there wasn't any knowledge that he did not possess. Lu's ritual weapon is a spear, just like the one of Odin, 
it doesn't miss its target. But unlike Odin's spear, it had the ability to return back into the hands of the thrower, similar to Thor's hammer. And according to the ancient Celtic tradition, someone who possesses a loose spear is in possession of power, a power that is rightfully true, truly righteous. Later, the Spear of Lu turned legendary as a spear of omnipotence. And Christianity certainly appropriated it in its own way, telling us that it is the spear of that same centurion who used it to kill Christ, the white god. But that was a later analogy. But prior to that, it of course was considered to be that magical artifact, the possession of which granted you to rule by right. And everyone who searched for it, they all had precisely that goal in mind. It is said that the ancient Druids, knowing the property of this spear, hid it and in its place made several fake doubles. And these fakes were the ones found by those who considered themselves in their right to have it. And many of those who thought that they had it in their possession experienced the greatest sorrow, when they just, in a matter of time, in a matter of a couple of years, got to lose everything not just what they've gained, but also what they used to have. And there are many stories like that. The latest one happened at the time of the Third Reich, when its leader believed to be in possession of the spear that was said to be kept in the Museum of Vienna. He took the spear and had it placed in the ritual hall in Wewelsburg Castle. And they've led many rituals trying to awaken its power, but were unsuccessful. And this Druid's curse has an explanation, has a name, and even its own myth related to ancient Irish legends, a threefold test, as well as what happens to imposters who lay claim to power but don't pass the trials. As previously said, the ancient dedicated the Lunasa festivity to Lu. It became Lamas a bit later. It came to be known as Lamas during Christianity, when only its agricultural aspects were supported, or at least weren't judged too harshly by their young religion of the jealous Judaic God. The pastors of that time turned a blind eye to these sort of things. But the ancient wolves, Druids, who dissolved amongst people, sometimes even assuming the likeness of monks, masking as them, they left us clues in forms of fairy tales, legends, and some even in mid-century annals, which were carefully kept in some faraway monasteries. They left us stories, placed memos, left us clues and semi-fictional stories about what sort of festivities these really were and why they were needed. Because the ancients, they knew. And Ireland is quite an amazing place in general. And we spoke about that the Irish Celtic tradition was working on varying the principle of impeccable kingship. Therefore, the principle of power was also being worked out there. And it was worked out quite strongly. And it is precisely there that during Lunasa, Ritual games were organized, ritual contests to celebrate with the objective of, on that day, 
At that time, the best of men, best of the best, gathered at assemblies, or tings, as they were called by the Irish Celts, and participated in contests similar to the Olympic Games. And these games, too, had their own regularity, similar to the Olympic Games. They gathered depending, some every year, some every three years, some every four years. The same thing happened in the Greek Olympic Games. The actual Olympic Games happened every four years and were dedicated to Zeus and Poseidon. There were also Panathenaic Games dedicated to the goddess Athena. And all of them happened to be sometime around the end of July, beginning of August. The symbolism of the Olympic Games and of the Irish assemblies was one and the same, to choose the best. They had to choose the best of the Greeks, and the Irish had to choose their best. What was it for? Because exactly during this festivity, in that ritual moment, it was determined which one of the living was worthy to take the spear of Lu and keep the watch of power in his place. While Lu, the young god, born of the goddess, is away, undergoing his own tests in this world as well as in others. It is on Mabon, the time of the waning of the water element, when the young god must depart for other worlds, depart to find new experience, an experience that can't be found here amongst people. But it is found amongst the Sita, among the Fomorians, amongst the non-living, amongst members of other worldly races and other worlds. But the power that was given to him can under no circumstances be lost, and so he left a man to remain in his place, the best man of them all. This is what Lunasa was about. Traditionally, Lunasad was celebrated in three different places in Ireland. One of these places was dedicated a name after Lu's foster mother. His wet nurse, by the name of Tailtu or Tailte, who adopted him when he was accepted into the tribe of the goddess Zanu's children. Different prescriptions of the name are pronounced differently, but the name Teltiu means earth, meaning that he, the survived god, was adopted by the earth herself. And here we have her image as the one who adopts, accepts someone as a foster child. That is the symbolism that manifests in someone who accepts the sphere of power, a hero who emerges as the best of the best in the Assembly Games or the Olympic Games. He is the one who receives the spear and accepts the reins of power until his projection his divine force, represented by the god Lu, departs for other worlds. And it is due to that that every king, every ruler was called God's representative on earth. He wasn't born this way, he became that according to these algorithms, this rule. It must necessarily be the one who becomes the best of the best, not someone born of kings, but the best of the best. He could have established a dynasty, but there were other rules for that. Three generations of impeccable descendants starting with you. Then this right to power was able to be passed on inherently. But this was curated by other gods and other forces, and other festivities will tell us those stories. For now, we are talking about the first chosen one, who is chosen particularly on Luna Sa. These contests were all different. 
and in three places. The ritually transpired in three different places, as if to symbolize that the rule must pass three contests and must be truly chosen as the best of the best. Someone who won in one place had to go against those who won in another place. And these rules, these festivities, these ritual games had to follow the strictest of rules, and this is also something that the legends tell us. For example, one of the locations in Ireland where the Lunasad assemblies took place was the area that later was described in the legend called the debility of the Ulster Man or Maha's curse. The Ulstermen, or Olaids, were a tribe who participated in the assembly. Several different representatives of Irish kingdoms gathered to compete for the right to be called the best. And so, one of the projections, manifestations of the Earth Goddess goes by the name of the red-haired Macha. We've already spoken of this wonderful goddess as one of the projections of the Triune Bridget. Macha was married to one of the men, and they had an agreement that she would stay with him under the condition that he would never disclose the fact that she is with him. So she stayed with him, bore him children, but one day the husband went to one of these assemblies where he bragged about his wife, how strong and hardy she is, how no one has a wife like that, one who bears children, plows the field, harvests the crop, runs faster than everyone else. And the assembly where he was at had a speed contest, and the king, overhearing the man, commanded him to bring his wife over to compete. Macha was in labor at the time, but she was told by drunk men to run beside two horses and prove that her man was telling the truth as a true warrior. And so the husband forced her to run. Once she finished the run, she cursed her husband along with all the other drunk men. After giving birth, she casted a curse in such a way that all the men of that area started having contractions and birth pains as women do during labor. And then Maha said to them that since they were so cruel, they would endure this curse for nine years on every lunasa. They would be unable to do anything. As weak as a woman in childbirth, they shall remain for five days and four nights. Not a day more and not a day less. But for nine years, they shall live with this curse. This means that for nine years, these warriors won't be able to win at the assembly and won't be able to receive the spear of power. An algorithm was formed, and there were other similar stories which showed how one can lose this battle simply by being careless in relation to Earth. Because it was her who once chose a husband for herself. She bore a god, and the one who showed himself to be the best of the best is as if a son to her an adopted son, just as Lu once was adopted by the goddess Taiyutiu. And so she too must adopt this man from the tribe of people, and he must be the best of them. But can someone be considered the best of them if he forces a woman to compete with a man? Can he really be the best of them if he forces a woman to do man's labor without considering her condition? or someone who brags about his achievements being unable to prove it.
This was written in other legends, less popular and less publicized, so to say. But nonetheless, one can find them in Irish manuscripts such as Mabinogion and the Ulster Cycle. It was also said that unfair winning was not allowed. There are stories about that as well. If we take these algorithms and try to apply them to the current world, our Olympic Games, for example, we will see that it is quite amusing. Because the meaning of the Olympic Games remained the same, to pick the best. Long time ago, in Greece and in the entire Peloponnese region, when the Olympic Games began, any wars, battles, conflicts, they stopped and were forbidden, as these games were something entirely sacred. Winning unfairly was forbidden, and the victor truly received it all, becoming a hero, down to the point that he could go up Mount Olympus. That is what happened to Perseus and to Hercules, who won at the Olympic Games and joined the pantheon of the gods. And nowadays, at the Olympic Games, when they started winning unfairly, the same algorithm was applied not so long ago. And you know that it was quite a scandal when it happened, when they proved that victory was won unfairly. And the current Olympic Games too are unfair, because the Ulster cycle is very clear about it. Women cannot compete in place of men. Do take notice of what was done incorrectly and what exempt of punishment according to the Ulster algorithm can be expected. That those who allow themselves this misconduct are preluded from asserting their claim to power for nine years. On the one hand, it is all mysticism, a conspiracy theory. We all know that to every mysticism and conspiracy there is a magical justification, and all of it serves as a foundation for the mythos. If people living today would approach the mythos more seriously, and understood that it is but a programmatic description of the algorithm, an algorithm which can't be bypassed, avoided or skipped. It existed forever and it will exist always, especially if it is firmly attached by a certain very important stake or a very important right, such as right to power, for example. They would perhaps have a different approach to their actions and would perhaps turn to the mythos more than they do. However, these are their problems now. Our task is not to allow these problems in our life. Your force, your young God, your inner hypostasis, which is you, in essence, the trials that shall be gone through between Luna Sad and Maybon, it has the same goal which is, in one part, in one magical part of consciousness to depart on a journey into other worlds to gain magical, otherworldly experience, and leaving another part of the consciousness to remain in the world of people, as the best, the best one in that reality where you are to reign as the one Lord and ruler where you are set to your own rules and not to accept the rules of others, where there will be only those who you consider your folk, where there are no strangers. And this means that you will have to prove to yourself and to your God, to the force that was born on Kupala, prove how much better you actually are. And according to this best one principle, it will get defined what volume of reality you get to possess by right, by true right. Not by the right given by law, by authority, by people, by consensus, by a compromise, or any other foolishness that has no relation to the mythos. The best cannot win by deceit, nor through stitch up nor by substitutions of functions. A woman is a woman, and a man is a man. And everybody must fulfill his own function, his own task. And one shouldn't assume a man for a woman, and a woman for a man, by applying certain functions where no one is able to fulfill them.
их выполнить. Те, кто Those who are nowadays involved in the substitution of concepts and attempting to override this algorithm through the Olympic Games are trying to accomplish that the power, the power of the best one, can be passed on not only through the Y chromosome, but through the X1 as well. But they forgot to ask the one who is the sovereign of all rights, all rights that are in existence here. Because it is not the gods who grant the rights, it is the earth. And if she says that the best is a king, then it is a king and not a queen, which means that it must be a king, because queen is something different. And queens have completely different tasks at hand, and a woman shouldn't be forced to do a man's job. And perhaps, going through the trials which will be revealed through the Lunasat festivity, we finally will realize this, and realize so well that we shall never swap the concepts ever again, and most importantly, would not fall for the provocations of this world, which is telling us from every toaster that all is actually the other way around, and that a pregnant woman can indeed lead an army. What will come of it, we will see in the next 50 days. But for now, let's get back to the ritual part of our Lunasat festivity. Scandinavians had it as well, and it was called Freyfaxi. And not that it was connected with the god Freyr, although his moniker is in the name. It was called that later, also due to a certain ritual action which actually has no connection to the god Freyr, but to one of the characters who won during a ting, during competitions that transpired in the Norse lands at the same time. Only there, they didn't involve people but horses. The horses competed. They had equestrian battles, and one such horse won in competition, and his name was Frey Faxi, so the festival was named after him. Scandinavians considered a horse to be the symbol of the future. Whoever's horse wins, his is the future, which is actually the same in essence. But people did not compete at the time, whereas in Ireland, the battles happened between people. The best man was chosen as king. They chose the best man.